teams to buy and sell after week one in college football. And Emery, we're going to start with you because you're the only one not taking a top 25 team. Why are you rolling with a service academy? Well, as always, you better schedule them week one or after a buy or get them in a bowl game because in between that, it's impossible to prepare for Army, Navy, Air Force. But I like what I saw from Army. I mean, Army is legitimately strong on both sides of the ball. They have athleticism and running back, a quarterback that can also throw. They're slowly approaching that Air Force quadruple option status, but I like what I saw from the Black Knights of the Hudson. Wait, Army has a quarterback that can throw? All right, now, now we're on to something. All right, Chip, you, Mike, and I are taking top 10 teams here, or very close. Penn State looked dominant against West Virginia despite a lightning delay. Why are they your team to buy after week one? Because they are one of those teams that I think looked like they were already on the third week of the season. And that is not what some might have expected, considering it is yet another offensive coordinator change there for Penn State. Andy Kotelnicki comes in from Kansas. And, you know, maybe you're thinking it might take a little while. But instead, what we saw is the best that we had seen from Drew Aller as a starting quarterback. The run game is living up to expectations. We've got, oh my gosh, rub your eyes, explosive plays out there. One of my big storylines from all of college football in week one is that for some teams it looked like they were still in the second week of fall camp trying to figure themselves out for other teams it looked like you're in mid-season form the Nittany Lions if we were just line them up and rank them for games that are going to happen tomorrow I think the Nittany Lions tomorrow are the second best team in the entire Big Ten and so uh, I, I'm buying all the stock at this price right now I love that call, Chip. I'm going to continue to buy Miami. I know it's a team we've talked about extensively in the offseason. Uh, I've been a big Cam Ward truther alongside Emory Hunt. Really, not quite as much as Emory. He's the guy that's really led the charge on Cam Ward. But when you look at this team, uh, they exceeded all expectations. Uh, and again, we were very high on them heading into that game against Florida. A hostile environment, but they didn't blink at all, really on both sides of the football. And it's the depth in that backfield. Honestly, Adrian Martinez did not get as many carries as I thought he would in that game. Uh, and they showed out that they have got some extreme, extreme depth. The schedule sets up very friendly. This is your last chance to go buy on this team to make the college football playoff. But they're a clear-cut favorite in the ACC and a clear-cut favorite for me to make the college football playoff. So I'm still buying Miami. Yeah, and M-squared, good, good credit to you as well for last week's show. I think you had a, a two-unit play on the Sportsline site on Miami on the money line. That was as easy, sweat-free as they get. My team to buy is Notre Dame. I mean, listen, they, they went into College Station 1 by 10, and they'll probably be favored by double digits in every game until they finish the regular season at USC. Probably still favored there, maybe a touchdown or less. That defense looks elite. They held uh, Texas A&M to under 250 total yards. And if they stay healthy, this team is a definite top four contender. But unfortunately, based on the way the college football playoff is, they cannot host or they, they cannot get a bye for the first round of the playoffs. They can host a playoff game in the first round, though. All right, team to sell. Emory, we're going to start. Oh, Emory, this is too easy. Come on. They're 0-2 already. You're going with Florida State. Well, I mean, just tell us why, I guess. Well, here's the reason why. Usually I don't make a big deal of teams being 0-2 because it's a long season, a lot of ball game left to quote my great friend Aaron Nagler. But when you look at Florida State, what bothers me about Florida State is what is causing them to be 0-2. We know they have talent. We know they're stockpiled elite level athletes. So that's not the case. What's troubling them is that they can't turn on physicality and toughness. That is a mindset. That is something that starts in winter workouts. And when we go out there and watch them down in, down out against two programs in Georgia Tech and Boston College get manhandled up front on both sides of the line of scrimmage. That's a problem they can't just fix overnight or turn on on game day. They got to start right now and really developing that mindset of physicality. That used to be the mantra of Florida State. We used to see Florida State every year in the draft have an offensive lineman go high in the draft and a defensive lineman go high in the draft. I don't know if we can say that now. They have to get better and get mentally locked into the season if they want to turn this thing around. It might be time for a quarterback change at some point. I mean, DJU, uh, I think I've seen enough. All right, M squared, you, Chip, and I have the same team that we're fading. Texas A&M started off. 
Yeah, it's got to be Texas A&M here for me. You know, you look at that matchup with Notre Dame, a lot of credit to Notre Dame going in that environment and winning. Uh, still not sure how elite that team is, but I am very skeptical of Texas A&M to begin with here. We talked about ahead of that game that the biggest edge on that game should have been that Texas A&M defensive line uh, against a young and inexperienced line for Notre Dame. That was simply not the case here. When you look at that matchup, Texas A&M allowed almost six yards per carry on defense and then offensively with Wegman just 2.9 yards per pass. Uh, not going to get it done. I was not impressed with Elko's coaching at all in that game either. Uh, when you consider how massive the home field advantage is at Kyle Field, a primetime game like that to only muster 13 points uh, and again, 2.9 yards per pass. Uh, not going to get it done. Not the easiest schedule uh, for this team either. So I'm going to sell Texas A&M because honestly it's not as bad as the Florida situation, but I don't think they have a quarterback. I don't think if they know it yet, but I'm not sure that Texas A&M really has a starting caliber quarterback. Bingo. Bingo, B-I-N-G-O, because I don't know if Connor Wegman can play at a level that's going to get Texas A&M to where Texas A&M wants to be. And he's definitely not going to do it in, with that offensive line, which had injuries coming into the season and came out of that loss to Notre Dame with even more injury issues. Uh, he looked panicked. He looked like there wasn't always uh, the right play to be made. And even when the throw was there and set up for him, because I do think Colin Klein is a very good offensive quarterback, coordinator. I, he just wasn't able to make it. I, I think that for everything that a Texas A&M fan is dreaming of in terms of what Mike Elko's team and what a Colin Klein offense can look like, I think they need a different quarterback. Connor Wegman, blue chip prospect coming out of high school. He's had trouble staying healthy, but I think we are starting to see another example of one of these players who just has not been able to put it all together. Um, you know, SEC defenses are going to be as tough as Notre Dame's defense. And I, I saw a quarterback who could not be a difference maker in that game. So I'm selling Texas A&M stock. What, what, how are we feeling about this Jimbo Fisher buyout right now? Not, not looking so great. Mike Elko's offense. And as you talked about both, both you and M squared chip, uh, Colin Klein, I, I mean, Connor Wegman at quarterback, Colin Klein calling plays. I don't think there's really an upgrade over, over what we saw with Jimbo Fisher the last few years. Definitely out on Texas a 